So what, we come from a situation here where antiretrovirals have completely transformed things, you know, where life expectancy is now, it's interesting, I was, I've been following this data quite carefully for the last two years, and it appears that the impact of HIV on your life expectancy is pretty much the same as diabetes is on your life expectancy, or heavy smoking, which is an interesting way to start thinking about and how it's changed in the last eight or so years. And in some places, life expectancy has actually normalized. In one study in Uganda, what was interesting is, this, is that um, their life expectancy normalized almost completely. And the reason for that probably is that in Uganda, you have almost no access to health care. The minute you enter the HIV system, you get access to all sorts of other health care, which is why instilling yourself in the system actually might show, start showing benefits. But whatever happens, we've got decades ahead of us for the people with HIV. But the reality check is this, and this data actually comes from 2000 and has not, I haven't seen an actual report, but the basic principles for why, uh, for which it was made on, is pretty much um, still holds because the HIV incidence rate has only gone slightly down. And that is a terrifying number, is that half of them will get, or well, half of us will get, half will get HIV, and half of us will need antiretrovirals and will need to be in a care system for the rest of our lives. Um, so we have to fix prevention. At the moment, we're getting about two people on ARVs for three, every three new infections. It's interesting, I've had to keep updating the slide because our, prevalent, our coverage of ARVs has actually steadily improved. I used to have four there and one there, and you can see how um, things have dramatically improved. The reality, though, is we're still chasing our tail, that you know, we're not getting to everybody who needs treatment. So what was the biggest news of 2011? This audience probably knows this better than most because one of the, the study was actually performed here in this unit. Um, I still think this is probably the biggest news of the last five years. And I think that there's still stuff coming out of the study which is incredibly important. For those of you who don't know, the HPT and 052 study was the one which showed that HIV doesn't transmit if you're on ARVs. Okay, that's kind of the headline news. But there was more to it than that. It's, and I want to draw out some of the challenges of prevention that you can see from the study. This study was amazing. I mean, it essentially said if your viral load is undetectable, you are essentially non-infectious. The 96% that everyone trumpets, if you look at the one case that actually got an infection, that patient almost certainly, um, their partner was a seroconverter at the time of initiation of therapy. So it was, all, for all intents and purposes, from what I can see, 100% effective. Now, it has lots of other implications which we can, choose, we can talk about, but it's, it's huge. The other thing which you must just keep your eye on is it was actually a kind of a when to start protocol as well. Um, and there's lots of data coming around this 350, 550 mark of starting ARVs there and what benefits you could get. But that's a talk for another day. It was also until, um, it was also one of the most expensive NIH studies ever performed. So, and it's still ongoing. I sit on the DSMB, but it's a fascinating amount of data that's coming out into the public sphere. I want to, so just what they did is they took 800 odd people in both arms and the one, they gave them ARVs, they, they all had CD4 counts over 350. Half of them they gave ARVs and the other half they didn't and they saw whether they, they passed on to the HIV negative partner. And what happened in there was there were, um, there were a whole, uh, in the arm that didn't go on to ARVs, there were 28 linked um, transmissions in the arm that was, um, that was treated, there was one and there were 27 in the delayed arm. The, what's interesting I found was there were 11 unlinked transmissions. Okay, now what that means is that there were 11 people who went and had, un, who contracted HIV outside the relationship. Now I want you to think about this for a bit though. These are people in sexual relationships with somebody who's HIV positive who know that they're negative, who have been counseled to death, okay, and I, people in this room will know how much counseling. These people have been told, if there ever was a reason to be careful about your sex life and to be thinking about the chance of contracting HIV and everything else, this group of people would be it. Okay. It's not like this is some sort of thing I've, I'm in denial about or in you know, I'm feeling stigmatized. These people were counseled by really good people and they had clear and present danger every time they had sex with their partner. Yet, they still managed to contract HIV outside their relationship. I find this absolutely shocking. I find this, I, I, I don't, I'm not judging these people. I'm, I'm talking about the fact that, you know, that this is how prevention failed. The thing is that you can find how prevention fails everywhere else. So if you look at, um, at this, so I'm jumping a little bit all over here for reasons I'm not quite clear on because I, um, 
we, one of the things that we always worry about is that people who take ARVs will be, it'll be like the invisible condom, that people will take ARVs and they will go and sleep around because now they're not going to infect anyone. In fact, precisely the opposite has been found in almost every single study. The minute people find out they're HIV positive or go on to antiretrovirals, they tend to behave themselves much, much better. Not so much the HIV negative population. And in fact, people go out and test indiscriminately for HIV it might actually be doing quite a lot of harm by giving people a negative, popular, uh, negative um, result and not hopefully uh, um, changing their sexual behaviors. So we're quite happy at the moment that most people who are HIV positive, who've had some counseling or gone to the ALV programs, aren't going, to, uh, aren't going to spread the virus further. And I'm going to show you now where those negative people are starting to show up and the data that we're getting about how these routine prevention interventions actually don't work. So what do we got in terms of the biology? I, whenever I'm talking to the behavior change people, they get all upset with me, but you know, here we have data that stuff actually does work. Um, the stuff that really works is treatment. Okay, if you give people ARVs that don't transmit, we've got tons of data on this now. You'll, I don't think you'll ever be able to do a similar antiretroviral study again. It's just open and shut um, data. And it's not just HPT and 052. There's lots of observational data as well. If people are given pre-exposure prophylaxis, so you give HIV negative people pre-exposure prophylaxis, it also protects, but you have to swallow the tablets, okay, which is <laughs> really interesting. In 052, um, people are HIV positive. They swallowed their tablets. Over 95% of them swallowed their tablets and took them every day and were behaved like a normal, everyday HIV patient. They were actually taking tablets not for their own health, but to stop their partner. In PrEP, where people are negative had to take the tablets, the same tablets themselves, they battle to get people to actually swallow the tablets. In fact, several of the studies had to be stopped because people wouldn't swallow their tablets. And the results have actually been very, they work when you swallow your tablets, but the results haven't been amazing overall. And you can see here, particularly in heterosexuals, it's been particularly bad. We all know about male circumcision. Um, here again is another PrEP study. The treatment of STDs is a controversial area, but I think most of us agree that treating them actually makes sense in terms of HIV transmission. The Caprice study, the microbicide study, which is now um, the, the repeat is happening within my unit, is, be, is, is carrying on. But you can see it wasn't a great um, result. It was pretty good. It was okay, but it wasn't overwhelming. And in fact, again, that was highly correlated with, um, with adherence. And finally, we have an HIV vaccine, which has what we would call sort of low efficacy, but has attracted a lot of excitement. And there are now studies continuing on that. So you can see the biological war. Treating people with HIV is probably the most effective thing you can possibly do. And there was a cost-effectiveness study presented at CROI um, looking at South Africa, suggesting that if we could get just everybody at 350 onto antiretrovirals, that would probably be, the mo one, the most effective, and two, the most cost-effective thing that we could possibly do. And I think for everybody here, that would probably make sense. So this was the Caprice 004. So this is the microbicide study. I went to, it was all terribly good. It kind of 39% provided, um, what, 40% odd um, reduction. But if you look here at the placebo groups, so that was the effective group, that was the placebo group. 11.2%, 10.5%, 10.2%, 9.4%. These people also counseled to death. Okay, condoms, STD treatment, don't go and sleep around, be careful, empowerment, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. This is how HIV works. One in 10 got HIV every single year. Like, where's the prevention? Like, how do you actually, do you think that in this audience of about 40 people, four people every year would fall HIV positive despite being told you'd be horrified? I was absolutely horrified when I saw this. So where is the behavior change? And it's something that we actually really have to honestly start engaging with because people keep saying, I don't think these people are abnormal, by the way. I think they're normal. And that's what the problem is, is that people are not acknowledging the fact that this is actually normal behavior, that the kind of behavior that people are asking for is actually the abnormal one. And here again was, um, in this study here, it was as high as 2%, um, and this was a, a much lower than the Caprice study, but still one in 50 people per year. So one, in this, what was interesting in this part of this PrEP study was that one third of participants in each arm reported sex outside their relationship. One third, you know? It's interesting, there was a study, um, published by the CDC, um, which Cindy asked me to find, which needless to say, I cannot put my finger on at the moment, which, su which suggested that in long-term American relationships, and I think it was more than 20 years or something was the definition, 80% of one or both partners cheated on the other. 
80%. So those of you who are sitting there thinking virtuously, oh, you know, I've never cheated on my partner. You're abnormal. Um, but what I'm saying is that trying to expect anything different from a general population, that's normal behavior. So how does transmission work? And how could a vaccine maybe, this is why I, I, I find ideas around HIV behavior change. As I'm very cynical about it, as you can hear about the whole thing. So how does transmission work? Well, this comes from an NGM article last year, which Mike Cohen wrote, which he was the head of the 052 study. And here you can see the female epithelium here. You can see um, here's the vagina, big thick layer, and here's the rectum. You can see there is a you know, single layer. This is why anal sex is much more likely to transmit. Firstly, because the layers are much thinner, but also because the, the access to sort of the deep tissues, these long living cells, is much easier. And you can see here the very, very thick squamous um, costume. You've got to think now for, an, for a vaccine to work, okay, it's got to kind of work here. Because the minute it gets past here and starts infecting these cells, it archives itself into this. And you can see how hard that would be. You, you've got to get a vaccine that's actually going to function within hours in terms of stopping the transmission. This is not um, rabies or something else where you can clear up the cells um, at this point. Once it's in there, it's in there. And some of these cells are amongst the longest living cells in the body. So we actually have a real um, problem within um, trying to design the vaccine right from the very beginning. And this shows the male epithelium. This is penile tissue. You can see also very, very thick. And again, suggests why you know, it's, it's much easier to to be infected via anal sex than through conventional um, in penetrative vaginal sex. So you all know this. You get this kind of viral load that goes up. And you remember this is a log scale. You all know this is when people are most infectious. It comes under control, and then this is your viral set point. And then you have all of these various things that happen, okay, which you need to know for the HIV management diploma, and then you can promptly forget. But you can see there's tons and tons and tons of stuff that's happening here, right at this, within days. Within 10 days, you're getting systemic responses. And the successful vaccine has to do several things at this point. It has to modify this aspect here. You know, once you get out here, it's... Uh, so what could it do? It could sterilize so that you don't get sick. Okay, so that's first prize. It could allow for a transient infection. And there's actually been quite a lot of... Um, there have been a couple of case studies of people who've looked what's looked like a transient infection who've been given ARVs, for instance, who get a viremia they go after a very high risk exposure, like a blood transfusion, and actually get virus in their bloodstream and then seem to clear it away. Okay, and there's two cases that were published this week of uh, um, CCR5 transplants, which suggest that we can genetically enhance people in such a way that they could actually clear the virus. And um, is again, it would be a transient infection. Could you control the infection? Could they become long-term non-progressors, or these elite controllers, which again, you guys have got a couple of in this unit, um, by giving a vaccine? So you don't stop them getting infected, but they don't, their viral load doesn't go up and they control it. And could we get something else, an altruistic vaccine where they're less likely to simply transmit the virus? So you kind of take your vaccine to, and these are all ideas for what the vaccine could do. So one of the things that's very we like about this is that the long-term control infections. We know now that ARVs, that the, the virus itself, the way the way the reason the ARVs work so well in terms of the long term is it modifies inflammation. It stops the virus from coming out, but it stops all the inflammatory markers, not completely, but largely and and overwhelmingly. When I was at medical school, I learned that HIV kind of you got infected and kind of hid away for like eight years and then came back and caused AIDS. Okay, and that was pre-viral loads. And we now know that that's absolute nonsense, that there's this incredible replication and that there's this war going on in the bodies of people with HIV from the word go. And that that war is slowly lost and that in the vast majority of people may get AIDS. And that this idea of chronic immune activation is one that is worrying us. It's also the reason why we, we worry that we might need to start antiretrovirals earlier at a higher CD4 count, that this might be causing lots and lots of harm. One of the things I always am amazed at is how much damage is done in the first two weeks of, antiretroviral, of, of HIV infection. I mean, I kind of always used to think, oh, it's like flu, seroconversion, and, you know, the virus disappears and your immune system takes care of it. And that is absolutely not the case. These people get abs incredibly high levels of infection, okay? And it's partly our own fault because we didn't measure where the damage was being done because sampling the gut, which is where the damage is done, is quite hard. And this shows you different areas where they looked at the number of CD4 cells. So we know that you get a bit of a drop in your CD4 cell le level in blood. 
We know in the mesenteric lymph nodes that you get a drop, okay? And you've, I've got a couple of pretty pictures to show you. But look at this in the jejunum. It's almost like no, nothing left. And this shows you beautifully. This um, shows you an HIV negative gut, okay? Being beautifully cleaned out. And these ghastly looking, cholesterol looking things here are actually payers patches that have been stained, which are healthy, believe it or not. Um, and you can see these thick, thick things. This is what an HIV positive acute seroconverter looks. And when, the, when this was put up, they said, look, this is what chemotherapy does. It just wipes out your immune system. And you can see they've just disappeared. What we thought would happen is we'd just simply grow back. But what actually happens is it does grow back with lots and lots of fibrosis. And this tube on, in your gut when you've got HIV is now inherently defective and may be defective for the rest of time because of that. We know that a lot of aging, as well as a lot of the um, progression of disease in HIV seems to be the translocation of various hohos and substances across this wall which seems to drive the HIV infection. Um, and I used to be like, these people go on about weird diets and things like, you know, you kind of want to nod, be polite and get out of the room as quickly as possible. <laughs> Actually, they might really look like there might be a role for specific diets looking at HIV which might modify the translocation of, um, of various things, uh, of these various metabolically active things across this wall. And it's a really interesting area is how do we modify this. So we don't, what the challenge of the vaccine is, you don't want this to happen, okay, because you're kind of left with this damage. If you don't stop the primary infection and you, do, you stop this chemotherapy reaction, you might not be able to modify this, the long-term effects of, uh, of HIV. This just showed you the difference in um, a lymph node. You can see here lots of nice stainy, browny looking cells. And the second you've got acute HIV, you can see how it starts thinning out. So, a lot of this data, this is actually data from um, Pretoria. There's a lot of interest in Pretoria of, uh, of uh, biopsying patients. And what they've demonstrated is that there is persistent microbial translocation. So they can measure lipopolysaccharides and a whole load of range of other chemicals in the bloodstream, which demonstrate that these things are actually crossing the, um, are, are crossing the gut barrier. And again, this thing about inflammation, it's what I, the, I didn't put in some of the other quotes. But over the past decade, it's been widely accepted that inflammation is a driving force between chronic diseases that will kill nearly all of us. So it's not just HIV positive people, it's everybody, okay, that needs to worry about inflammation. But HIV in many ways is starting to become a template along with diabetes for both accelerated aging and for, um, and for inflammation more generally. Mediating inflammation in chronic disease is a new frontier, it's successful and certain. And this is a, a very nice review article, a couple of review articles in science about two years ago. And urge you to go back and read it. It's really interesting. But certainly bringing down the viral load is probably the best thing we can do at this point. Trying to find other ways of, of moderating that inflammation is going to be the next frontier. So how does this all help us? Well, I'm sorry this is not projecting terribly well, but as I said, this is the viral load that goes up and then you get your set point. This is your C4 count takes a bit of a dip and then trickles downwards until you start getting sick. But there's a Hang of it. What you get first is a whole lot of anti-HIV T cell responses, which I'll come back to in a second. Um, followed by the antibody response. Okay, so your kind of cellular responses are actually right up there at the front. And there's a big debate within the vaccine world, which I can barely understand, trying to work out whether a T cell response or an antibody response is the way to go. And then you finally, once everything's settled down, you get your viral set point, and that seems to indica uh, indicate some roughly uh, how quickly you're, you're going to progress to AIDS. And I've put here this clinician's understanding here. A lot of important stuff happens here. Okay. Now, if you measure every single cytokine, everything that's happening within patients with HIV, it is an absolute mess of cytokines and antibody responses and cellular responses. And it doesn't seem to be that easily quantified. And again, this, this um, unit and some of the other units in Joburg and throughout the country have been trying to clarify what is actually happening there as a way of trying to develop this vaccine. Try to work out what are these cellular responses. And we know that, for instance, the um, CTL responses, if you have a weak CTL, you progress to age much quicker. And if you have a strong one, you progress more slowly. That doesn't mean it's... So this is where the whole viral load, can we strengthen the CTL responses by giving a vaccine? So you get HIV, I'm sorry. But instead of progressing to AIDS very, very quickly, um, you're going to take 20, 30, 40 years to actually progress. Now, unfortunately, people like David are going to make my life very difficult because they're going to start them on ARVs. It doesn't matter whether they've got strong, weak or, or strong CTLs. 
So there is quite a lot of fear in the vaccine world that if we do start starting our ARVs earlier and earlier, this actually might become moot, that simply modifying how long quickly you have to introduce it might actually be irrelevant. And this is not as an inexpensive business, testing vaccines, just like testing drugs. They are having to sink billions of dollars. So this, you know, for a drug company, I would think would be an extremely high risk thing to start going after, but we'll see. Um, what they've looked at, they started, this was some data that was actually taken from the IRV um, group a couple of, I think it was two or three months ago, where they modeled how many infections you could avert. So this was a kind of a very weak vaccine, a moderate vaccine, and a very effective vaccine. What's more interesting is the cost of this. So here's the cost of antiretroviral therapy, lifetime cost of $7,400. These are the costs, I, I, you can't see them here, but this is the rotavirus vaccine, which is 30 um, US cents. This is the pneumococcus um, vaccine, vaccine that, that Dave was just talking to you about, which is $3.60. And this is the HPV vaccine, which Cindy was talking to you about, which is $360. An HIV vaccine is not, these are the kind of cost-saving things measured against treatment that it needs to be. If we only have a very mildly effective um, vaccine, we'd need to make it 25% and we could charge up to $800 for a 70% effective vaccine. So if you're using this $360 HPV vaccine, which has been an incredibly, exp it's, it's, as you heard from Cindy, it's regarded as a very, very expensive vaccine, um, drug companies are going to be very excited if they find a 70% one. It looks like they can charge a lot for it. Maybe a little less excited for a less effective one, although it's still $25 per vaccine. is not bad going from where I sit. So in South Africa, um, We've got 2.7 new infections in 2010 and 1.8 million deaths. The epic, so, uh, you know, there's a need. The conventional HIV prevention programs are, I think, as I said, disappointing is the charitable term. I think, like, catastrophic would be my, uh, my um, term. Or, uh, but, so we need all this other stuff. The problem is these newer technologies, microbicides are a year away. Okay, there is... The fact study which has been performed at the moment is unlikely to have a result for the next two or three years. Then they've got to stop manufacturing. Then we've got to get out there. Then we've got to persuade a whole lot of women to actually use this stuff. I am very, very wary about it. PrEP is still desperately trying to find a place. I have yet to see wide-scale PrEP programs. Um, we're looking at our truck drivers and our sex workers here in Hilbra as a, potentially as a group that we could be looking at. Um, adolescent girls, imagine going to schools and saying to the parent-teacher association, their little darlings are all going to go on to PrEP because they're sexually active. I <laughs> wish them well. Um, and male circumcision has actually um, been disappointingly um, rolled out. In some places, actually, it hasn't been as successful as we'd think. In other places, it just hasn't been pushed as hard as it should. But that's certainly something that's under the... Th Test and treat. So if we treated everyone immediately when we found them, gave them ALVs immediately, that would work, I think. The problem is the challenge of a weak healthcare system. I mean, we battle to even just hold our current patients here. And I mean, everybody in this room knows how hard we have to work to make this happen. And we do a good job. But if we suddenly were confronted with four, five-fold numbers of this, especially people who are healthy, who have never had any illness, I think that that's a huge challenge. Notwithstanding the cost and everything else of it. I think it's something to consider. I, I, I have mixed feelings about it. I think that at the moment, the health system needs a lot of help. and. Uh, I, I don't think it's, it's really for prime time just yet. The cure, these two cases that were published this week, which were interesting, is the treatment's much worse than, than the disease in this case. So just for those of you who think that this is cool and they're going to start referring to the Joburg Gem for a stem cell transplant, don't. Um, but the, I urge you to look at the two cases that were published this week. They were very, very interesting. Again, they gave the patients, they, um, they gave them transplants with CCR5 modified um, marrow. And even if we got, um, with, we got test and treat going, the, the projections are that we're getting close to a million new infections worldwide in just in 2020. So that's a hell of a lot of stuff to stop. Is there a cure in sight? Um, there's been a lot of stuff um, do, done by David Margolis. He's actually just received a massive grant to look at um, a drug called Veronistat, which is, I always think of, the only way I can remember it is to think of Velociraptor and then to extrapolate it back to Veronistat. Um, and he's doing a whole of very exciting work looking at unlocking these, these sentinel sites. Um, I must be honest, I, I hope he gets it right, but I think for most of us, when we look at the basic science, this looks slightly, looks like it's going to be hard. Um, 
This, uh, they, before, they used to use interleukins and, um, and thymocyte globulins, which we used a lot in transplant. And you can see that they managed to, this is before and this is after. You can see these are all just um, sentinel, um, th these are archive virus, which has just been switched on, and suddenly it goes all nice and bright red. Um, you all remember this famous study where everyone talked about you could cure HIV, and then in 1999, somebody did a study that looked at if we maintained ARVs and kept the viral load undetectable, it would take 60 one year is to um, eradicate all the sentinel sites. That means that if you start at the age of 25, you can stop your ARVs when you're 86, <laughs> which is possibly not what any one of us would want to do. I'm going to come back to cost in a second, but vaccine is not the only game in town. However, I think that we all, there's a very wide acceptance of, uh, of vaccines in our society, as opposed to microbicides or PrEP or, any of the, or even treatment as prevention. Um, and certainly in Africa, vaccine programs have been incredibly effective. If you look at the benefits of the, say, the polio vaccine and the hepatitis B vaccines, um, I'm a strong believer in vaccines. And I think things like the HPV vaccine make a huge amount of sense because they're quite easy to, in put on, to inflict on the population as opposed to some of the other prevention stuff we have. So where is it? If it's so bloody well there, it is... H it's because it's hard. We, HIV is the most researched disease ever. People forget this. There's been more money thrown at HIV and appropriately so than any other illness. The US head of health um, in 1984 said we'll have a vaccine by 1990. And Robert Gallo, who's now in 2012, said I think we will have a vaccine in the next 10 to 15 years. And then maybe we can stop some of the other antiretroviruses, uh, other retroviruses. This suggests to me that this is damn hard. Okay. Even if we get this thing in 15 years, the lead time to it is another 15 years to the population effect. So that's, if he's right, it's going to take 10 to 15 years. That's another, I'm going to be retired, which scares the hell out of me. Um, by the time this thing actually starts working. So the vaccine is an investment in a very long future. Okay, so all that moaning and groaning I was doing at the start about the HIV prevention effects, I hold, but we still have to get the other stuff right. It's not like this is the only thing that we need to be focusing on. It's, uh, it really is an investment in our grandchildren more than anything else. And Tony Fauci wrote this really interesting uh, article. Again, I urge you, this one, he's, firstly, he's apparently visiting here in the next few days. So um, he wrote Harrison's, which we all physicians have to genuflect to every day. Um, uh, and he's, he identified quickly the, op the obstacles. What we were talking here, the window to stop it before HIV integrates, you've got a couple of days or weeks. The vaccine has to stop that. You've got to stop that terrible chemotherapy reaction. You've got to deal with the fact that this virus mutates at a rate of knots, and that makes viral des vaccine design really difficult. And that there are certain antibody targets, but they're often hidden from the immune recognition. And here are a couple of um, suggestions, and I'll show you another study that was released, um, another paper that was actually released last week, um, again, reinforcing the fact that we actually need to move faster with these kind of studies. I'm going to, have to actually just go, I'm not going to leave this, I think. It's just rather let's leave some of the time. For those of you who actually could interested in immunology, you can take this. Um, so I just want to just, just stop with the, it may not prevent infection, it may alter the set point. So this is what, it might stop us from, it might not stop you getting HIV, but it might alter your set point. And this showed it just very, very nicely, again, from a, a nature review a couple of years ago. So you might get your viremia, but your vaccine either would stop, would, would amend that viremia or actually uh, delay it completely and you'd be turned into long-term non-progressive, what people like to call sometimes functionally cured. Um, there's a whole lot of things that they're using um, and this has become far more important than we thought because um, with one of the other viruses that where, you, where, where you use a live attenuated virus where they use it to administer the vaccine, people had antibodies actually got an increased rate of HIV. So it's, quite hard to design these studies because you actually have to build into them now the chance that you actually might make HIV acquisition worse. So what do we have? We have multiple failures of these, virus, uh, of these vaccines over the 90s and the 2000s. We've had the CHAVI initiative, which is looking at huge amounts of money was given to try and identify what's happening in the HIV acute HIV scenario, which has given us a lot of work. The Merck vaccine of 2009, and this was apparently a very well-researched vaccine, a lot of very bright people were involved in it, and a lot of money was poured into it, actually increased HIV transmission rates. It's a bit like some of the older um, microbicide studies. This latest um, 
RV144 combination and was, um, was mildly protected, provided 30% protection, but was done in Thailand only. So again, you've got to be careful, like, will it work here? And this, I love this quote from one of the researchers. No one knows why it worked and none of the others didn't. Which is not exactly overwhelmingly <laughs> confidence-inducing, but um, Lynn Morris, who's our own local um, vaccine hero, um, sometimes if you give her a glass of wine you can, and you push her a little bit, she says, we don't really know why most vaccines work. So maybe that's... A, um, I'm almost done. This is just demonstrating one of the other things which we mustn't forget is just because a vaccine works in one place, the clade differences across the globe are profound. We have an almost exclusive clade C epidemic here, but it varies dramatically across, even within um, Central Africa, it varies dramatically. So we'd have to test it in one place and then go elsewhere. Now, luckily, as I said, in South Africa, at least we um, almost exclusively clade C outside of um, uh, of some foreigners coming in from, from Northern Africa or from the rest of the world. So this is my last two slides. Can vaccine research accept another failure? And I would argue that it has to. I don't understand how in the long term we're going to contain this disease unless something else comes along that really is just going to change the way we understand it. I, I think a vaccine is the only way. And I think that people who get frustrated with vaccine research and stuff need to just suck it up and they have to get on and fund this stuff. And it's going to be a long haul and it's going to be and hopefully we'll learn something useful in the, while um, we go through failure after failure until we actually find something. Um, yeah, I told you, this is Lynn's quote. HIV vaccine research is teaching us how little we know about how other vaccines work. And that's also interesting because you know, the, pneumococ the pneumococcal vaccine, as David showed you, had very complex um, history. It didn't work beautifully and happily. The TB vaccine industry is having, it's battling, has finally got some things which look like it might work. But it took ages. And the malaria vaccine that we're finally getting some benefit from is also another one that's been pretty. This is the, my last slide, but this paper came out last week, which I'd suggest you all go and read. Um, it was published in Jades. Um, there is no question that a global solution to the HIV epidemic will not be economically or logistically feasible without the development of vaccine that provide durable protection. All the other stuff there is dressing, in my view. I really think that this is the only thing that is going to really, really take care of it. But the problem with this is one of the major constraints moving forward will likely be constraints on funding. And this is not going to be a cheap business. So we've got to be pushing our governments, we've got to be pushing the funders and all of that to actually shove money into the vaccine. And for once, I have no vested interest in this because it's just going to mean less and less patience for me. But I do think that um, there's no other way shortcut to it. Thanks very much.